lighter nightmares. I don't have my glasses on today, so Ooh. I'm a little punchy. Oh, uh, <laughs> oh yeah, let's do this. <laughs> my name is Clark Wolf. It's nice to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. We've got a great show today. I'm very excited. Uh, and let's go ahead and introduce the panel. First to my left is Miss Perry Nemiroff. I am extra excited today because I'm on Red Bull today. Oh. You will oh, find boy. out very soon. Oh. I am very tired. <laughs> oh, heavens, heavens, heavens. And to her left is Mr. John Schnepp. Hey, what's going on? Wait, Clark, where'd you go? Whoa. I don't have my glasses on either. Oh, no. Wait, I can put them back on. Hey, well, very glad I'm here, Faf Bender. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, heavens. It's going to be a good one today. And to my right is Mr. Mark Riley. How you doing, Collider Nightmares? I have nothing more to add. That was an awesome opening right there. So let's just go right to it. All right. Let's do it. Let's dive into fresh meat. Squish, fresh squish, meat. Squish, fresh squish. meat. All right. First up, Michael Pena is a busy man. Earlier this week, it was confirmed that the actor would be returning to the Marvel Universe to co-star in Ant-Man and the Wasp. This was in addition to the news that the actor would lead the much buzzed about script The Bringing for Sony. Based on the infamous Cecil Hotel in Los Angeles, The Bringing was a 2014 blacklist script and sparked a bidding war uh, amongst studios. At one point, the Neon Demon director Nicholas Winding Refn was in talks to the direct. Now, Jeremy Levering is at the helm with uh, the director cutting his teeth in television, including directing an episode of Sherlock and the horror movie In Fear. The latest draft of The Bringing was written by Starry Eyes Dennis Widmeyer and Kevin Klosh. Um, I always say Kevin's name wrong. Sorry, mm-hmm. Kevin. Uh, and so, okay, this is a really exciting thing. Now, Michael Pena um, was last seen, correct me if I'm wrong, internet, I'm sure you will, um, in a genre movie in uh, the Vatican Tapes, which was an exorcism drama where he played played a priest. Um, he was very good in it. The movie wasn't just okay, I'd say. Um, but uh, I think this is kind of an interesting thing because we know for a fact that this movie, it, well, plot details are scarce is going to be a pretty heavy drama considering all the things that went on in the Cecil Hotel and for you guys at home if you haven't read about this just google Cecil Hotel Los Angeles and you will see some really crazy stuff um all right so let's go ahead and start with you Mark Riley now yeah. are you on board with Pena taking on a dark drama like The Bringing absolutely uh Michael Pena he stole the, the movie in Ant-Man in my in, in my opinion and he is a standout in every movie he's done since. So I am so interested in this story in particular because of that viral video mm-hmm. that went out. It's about this woman that ended up in a water pipe somehow. So I'm interested to know what the, like I know they, the plot details are a little scarce, but I'm hoping it's supernatural. I'm hoping that there's, it kind of gets into this mythology of the hotel and that there's more that I don't know because it's a fascinating story to me just from that video alone and how this woman ended up in the, in the water pipe, my God, it's crazy. So with Michael Pena, come on, this is great. Yeah, definitely. Now, Perry, are you as enthusiastic? Because we know the nitty ditty, the n- <laughs> nitty ditty, <laughs> bang the, bang, the nitty ditty. <laughs> my words are not. Uh, not there. <laughs> the nitty gritty of these stories is pretty intense. It's pretty graphic. And um, these studios seem to be taking this movie really seriously, considering all of the um, financial back and forth. Like, they wanted to lock this script down. Yeah, I think it's about time. I mean, a blacklist script, how can you say no to something like that? And now with Michael Pena board, God, I'm all for it, and I really do think it's going to start moving forward a little faster. I wish I had seen uh, Jeremy uh, Lovering's last movie. I just remember when it premiered. uh, It's called In Fear, and when it premiered, I believe it might have been at Sundance or some other festival, they dropped a really cool poster for it. I'm like, I want to see that movie because I want to own the poster, and I want to earn the right to own the poster and hang it up. And then I don't know what happened in the movie. It never really came out, but I'm probably going to hunt it down now so I can have a better idea of what he's doing here. But I love hearing all these crazy stories about this hotel. So they have so much potential. Fun fact, though, if you can see, I don't know if you could see it on regular IMDb or just IMDb Pro, but under the special thanks section of the page, it says in memory of Elisa Lamb. So oh, wow. that could mean it is strictly exploring that. And if that is the case, I mean, wow, that this could be one heck of a film. That's very interesting. All right, Schnepp, how about you? Are you on board for Michael Pena being a very serious detective? 
perspective. Yeah, yes and no. I mean, when I heard Michael Pena was involved and I kept, I kept calling it the bringing because I can't bring myself to say the bringing. It's just a weird title. Yeah, I don't know what the title yeah, means. I think yeah. just, just change it to the bringing and I think a lot more people will bring themselves to the theater. Uh, Michael Pena, though, he just makes me laugh and I think it's because of Ant-Man, so it's harder for me. Even though he's done a ton of serious roles, now I have that burned into my mind as comedic take. So when I think of him in this, I just kind of see him as like, a comedic role i'm sure that's not mm -hmm. the case and i'm sure he will bring it in this role but seeing the seeing that uh, clip that's online of her like talking to ghosts in the, oh, in the elevator and then really knowing eerie. what happened is is really uh upsetting on multiple layers so i i'm interested in seeing what the script by the starry eyes guys yeah. what it is i'm sure it's creepy as hell because i love starry eyes so i'm excited to see this film we got to get Dennis and Kevin on here. Yeah, bring I, it I, on. I keep teasing that, and we need to like actually do it. Maybe we can pull some info Let's out Let's get of down to the nitty-ditty. The nitty-ditty, <laughs> Dennis and Kevin. Okay, <laughs> next up, Creep, the independent feature film uh, produced by Blumhouse Productions' Jason Blum and Mark Duplass, who co-starred and received story by credit, was divisive when it made the rounds on the festival circuit a few years back. Directed by and co-starring Patrick Bryce, the weird little movie found a big audience audience on Netflix, and it was long rumored to be part of a trilogy. Even if the film doesn't get a third movie, it looks like it is getting a sequel. As Duplass tweeted out, trying on wardrobe today for Creep 2, this one is going to get a little bit weird. Uh, for those who have seen the first, that is definitely an understatement. And uh, so Bryce went on to be a guest on the New Flesh podcast, where he explained that there's been no event, uh, no <laughs> that can't be right. But he explained that there was no official announcement, but it's out there now and we better make a good movie. Now, Perry, you interviewed uh, Mark Duplass back for Collider back mm -hmm. in 2014, and he was already talking about a oh, trilogy yeah. for this movie. I had seen this movie when I believe it might have been the world premiere at South by Southwest. I believe it was 2014, maybe 2013. That might be too early, though. But anyway, at the festival, I was there and divisive bothers me because I absolutely love of this movie. This is just such a, a nice, neat, fun, crazy, really brutal story. And I love the idea of them turning this into a trilogy. What really intrigued me about the trilogy idea two years ago, though, was first, when they got the rights to the movie, like right off the bat in April 2014, they announced that they were turning it into a trilogy. They didn't even let the first movie come out. They're just 110% behind the idea to make three films. Then I followed up with Duplass in August, and I was like, you know, what's up? What's up with my trilogy? And at that point, he was pretty set on moving forward. He, mm. I think he had even said, uh, yeah, I was good and wrote down the quote. <laughs> I think he had said that the plan was to move forward with the second one later in the year. And then, this is the coolest part, what the original plan was, at least, was they were going to release all three movies in 2015. Yes, yes. That is just, why is some other franchise not trying to do something like mm. that? That is binge watching for feature films. Yeah. That's the coolest thing ever. And I'm not going to spoil anything about Creep, which, again, I love, highly recommend it. Please go watch it if you haven't already. But the format and the story and the material in Creep does suit itself for that kind of release. So I wish they would keep that idea in mind. But at this point, I'm just really happy that they're finally moving forward with a sequel. Well, these movies are so cheap to make. I mean, you know, obviously. And and uh, but I actually have a quick question, a quick follow up for you. The version you saw at the festival, was that the same version that got released? Because I was under the impression they did a lot of reshoots. I believe so. But I've watched the uh, the version that they've uh, actually released so many times. I don't know. You, to be honest, I don't know okay. if I can remember the specific differences. All right. So, Mark Riley, what what about you? Are you on board for some more creepy Mark Duplass? Absolutely. Uh, I love Mark Duplass, and it's so it's so funny. I've seen this in my queue on Netflix, and I've passed by it, and it's under critically acclaimed movies. And I keep looking at it, and it has a great poster, it has a great title, mm -hmm. and I'm like, eh, and I move on. So I have to give up my card here for Collider Nightmares, I'm sure, but... This, I like what the, I, I had to go and do some research on like what it's actually about. I love the idea that it's about a guy that answers a Craigslist ad. I mean, right away, that should tell you everything. That's creepy enough. So 
I, I'm glad. I love the uh, what he's talking about for what you were just talking about, Perry, with trying to release three of them in, in the movies. I just like that it's independent, mm -hmm. that they're doing something creative. So I got to catch up. That's all I have to say. Yeah, I mean, for a guy who's maybe best known for the league, I would say, you know, which is <clears throat> decidedly not horror, or, <laughs> or yeah. it's pretty funny. But um, all right, Schnepp, how about you? So I, you started the movie, turned it off. Are you on board with one and two and three creepies? Well, I definitely want to finish it. I just ended up like, I was even thinking about seeing it last night, and then I ended up watching Baskin instead, which we'll talk <laughs> about at some later date. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, creep. It, it, the premise looks cool. I just, you know, I got to stop watching movies at one in the morning so um yeah i'm definitely gonna see it now and hearing about creep 2 and i love duplass what was the film you mentioned earlier the i think it's called the one i love the one that I was love. the movie that i was had interviewed fantastic for. well duplass is just really such a great filmmaker yeah. just in terms of him coming up with ideas and the way he approaches it so he knocks out films and it's like Fast. the brothers right the duplass mm -hmm. brothers are like multiples of it. i'm not, not sure just how him. much like how what, many duplass they work there on are. together yeah. for separately but, but he but. solo has done a lot of really cool mm -hmm. things so uh, anything he's working on i try to check it out so I'll definitely see Creep this week and report back next week. Good. You better. Yeah, Creep, for you guys who are interested uh, to see what we're talking about, it is on streaming on Netflix Instant right now. And I believe the movie is an hour and 20 minutes long, maybe. So you're, like, investing, like, one and a half episodes of Stranger Things. Come mm. on. You can do it. Uh, <laughs> it's totally worth it. Okay. Next up, uh, DP turn director John Leonetti is staying very busy. After directing the box office smash Annabelle, he quickly moved to his next feature, currently in post production, a Manson family inspired horror thriller named The Wolves at the Door. Uh, and while he may be attached to a 50s era mu movie musical <laughs> titled At the Hop for his next film, he won't stray away from horror long. This week we learned that Leonetti would be re-teaming with his Conjuring co-star Joey King for Wish Upon. As Deadline reports, Wish Upon, written by Barbara Marshall, follows the 16 year old, uh, follows a 16 year old misfit Claire, who finds a magic box that promises a chance at the life she's always wanted but she never could have imagined that each wish would demand a deadly payment 13 and twilight director katherine hardwick was originally attached to the project before leonetti took over the trade also notes that production is set to begin this fall so i read one one article is they kind of described it as like an update of Wishmaster, but it's sort of a dark genie story mm. um schnepp you know i you are actually really forgiving when it comes oh, i don't mean forgiving but you seem to sometimes like teenage stories mm -hmm. coming of age stories especially when they're mixed with horror does sure. this sound appealing to you i would use the word forgiving um <laughs> yeah you know what but i'm also i'm a fan of the old wish masters like well bring me your wishes what are your wishes <laughs> you know i think they made like nine wish masters <laughs> the first two are pretty awesome i think the first one's awesome and then they just kind of fall apart just like all of those like you know if you're watching hellraiser nine i don't know why you're watching it but <laughs> You know, they all kind of like fell apart once they get to like seven, eight or nine. But uh, yeah, if this is an updated Wishmaster, count me in. I'm going to watch the gin or whatever they end up calling this new version of the Wishmaster. But it sounds cool to me. Yeah, Perry, how about you? Would you like to see this sort of coming of age story? I think I'm kind of curious. I'm not the biggest Annabelle fan, so it's a little hard for me to get behind this right now. But I do really like Joey King, even though the last things I've seen her in were, I think it was Stonewall and Independence Day Resurgence. So mm. Roland Emmerich is not doing the poor girl any favors right now. But one of the first junkets I ever did was one of her big uh, movies, Ramona and Beezus. It came out in like 2010. Mm -hmm. I knew nothing about it, but it was my first time in a junket situation. So ever since then, I've always just watched what she's done. And everything she's in is really great. So I think I'm okay with this until I hear more about the style and, you know, this is this in the style of this or whatnot. It's hard to know what to make of it, and I also want to see a little something else from Leonetti as a director right. before I can really get behind it. Yeah, you know, I was looking up John Leonetti last night because I did not realize that Annabelle was not his first movie. He's directed a lot of other stuff, including Mortal Kombat Annihilation. Mm. Whoa, nice. um, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, so so interesting. But, you know, Joey King, for me, was one of the breakout stars of The Conjuring. I loved her performance, and I kind of like the idea of seeing her in a teenage girl situation, kind of letting her grow up a little. Mm. Um, Riley, how about you? Would you see this movie? Yeah, I, I like movies about, like, 
getting wishes and the consequences of these wishes. Um, it also reminded of that short story, uh, Monkey's Paw, uh-huh. which then did a funny Simpsons Treehouse of Horror <laughs> where you wish and, and the fingers go down and then the consequences come up. So I always like those. And I actually didn't hate Annabelle. I will say about Annabelle, there's some great creepy shots. So I think uh, Leonetti has it in his wheelhouse to do something. And I'm with you, Clark. I really like um uh, uh, sorry. Drinking. Yes, thank you. And I think that, you know, the pair of them. This is a great. We'll see if it's a wish, wish master kind of story or whatever. But it, I, for me, you can't really go wrong. I like these movies about wishes, so I'm interested. You could see, like, you know, there's the. Uh, I think it was Kelly's. He made this film, uh, The Box. Yes, remember that? Yes, mm. I want a remake of The yeah. Box. That's the great. premise what. of The Box was fantastic. Yep. In fact, yeah. the first like 30 minutes is incredible. Then yep. it kind of gets super weird. Or like even the Brass Teapot, which is also another kind of like you get this magical wish type thing. So those those films, the premise of those always have the most potential. So yeah. that's why I'm interested. It could kind of be a loose carry update that we never got. Like I personally really didn't like the Carrie remake. Um, but regardless, uh-huh. <laughs> Perry, I guess. I love Perry's no. reaction. <laughs> I, I didn't love it by any means, but I definitely didn't have a strong reaction to it. Oh yes. Well I had a very strong reaction. But regardless, um I think I thought when they said they were gonna remake Carrie that this was actually a perfect idea because I think we were talking when we do talk a lot about bullying, about teenagers, about and that in our culture right now. And I think the idea of a girl who's kind of like shy but gets this power uh, mm. but does she use it for good or does she use it for evil like I'm ready for a, one of those stories and I'm ready for it to be vicious and I'm ready for it to be like good and so that's what I'm really hoping for yeah. um, so those are my notes John Leonetti call me if you have any other <laughs> questions about what I would like to see from this movie okay moving on let's get Uh-oh. into what's in the box what's, what's in the box what's in the box Okay, um, oh, Red Bull down. Red Bull. Red Bull get, down. Her, get her another Red Bull. <laughs> it's a good thing I drank it really, really fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so, okay, American Horror Story, you big tease, you. With still so much mystery and mind games surrounding season six of the horror anthology, one thing is for sure. AHS will be coming to Halloween Horror Nights in Orlando and Hollywood this September. Featuring the rubber man from the inaugural Murder House season, Twisty the Clown from Freak Show, and an appearance from the Countess uh, from Hotel. American Horror Story will be making a big splash this year. The Emmy-winning series joins The Exorcist, Freddy vs. Jason, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Halloween, The Walking Dead, and the new Christmas-themed maze Krampus, which I know Schnepp will not be going to, (laughs) at the U.S. Parks. (laughs) Meanwhile... FX isn't doing us any favors uh, in terms of telling us what the new season is going to be, releasing promos for season six on what seems like a daily basis. Uh, Recently, FX CEO John Landgraf explained that one of these hypothetical themes is accurate and the rest are misdirects. Uh, AHS question mark season six, uh, because that's what I'm calling it, because that's what their promotional materials say, uh, premieres on September 14th with the Halloween Horror Nights mazes opening two days later. All right, Perry. I you are not you are not having this this I'm season. I'm really freaking annoyed. I mean, all right. First, just to get it out of the way, Halloween Horror Nights. Yes, and yeah. I want to go. So I've actually never been to one oh, on wow. either coast. So now wow. that I live out here, I want to go, and I'm really pumped. Now to the problem. <laughs> what they like, really? What is this nonsense? They do this every season where they release a bajillion 15 second promos before the actual season airs, mm-hmm. which, okay, it's a little annoying every single year, but at least they announce the theme before so you can have some fun with the material they're releasing. This feels like manipulative garbage and it's pissing me off. Yeah. I can't get excited for anything that I'm seeing because I don't know if they're just like pulling my leg or whatnot. I'm sick of it. I just want my damn theme and I want I want to be able to look forward to the new season. I am absolutely <laughs> livid that this is the way they're approaching it. But to play the game that we're gonna do right now, if I had to pick of these bajillion promos that they've released that I would like to see, the two that have caught my eye is the one is the one called Camp Sight, which is the alien abduction one where she's like laying down and just gets plucked right up. And then I like the look of Sunset Troll with the three people with the sunset behind them and the eyes. So 
I don't know what those themes would be. Those look cool, but like, oh, dear God, never do this again, ever. This, I, I am a big American Horror Story fan, and this breaks my heart. It makes me feel like I'm being manipulated, and I don't like it. Well, girl, amen. <sighs> I think you said it Hell all. Yeah. Uh, if you had a mic, you, sh you should drop it. Yeah, really. Yeah. Uh, you so, don't want me dropping anything else on No, I guess right not. <laughs> drop your Red Bull. Um, well, okay, but you know, you bring up a valid point, and I think that your frustration is actually shared by a lot of fans, but ultimately, is American Horror Story sort of making a promise they can't fulfill? Like, could everything, could anything actually live up to all of this hype? Schnepp, what are your thoughts here? See, I'm, I'm going the complete opposite ah. direction. I think even though the, you know, whoever the producer, CEO, whatever the dude was like, you know, only one of these is actually going to be the blah, blah, blah. I think all of those, and my guess would be it's about making a horror film. So this this season is going to be a behind the scenes making a horror film. It's like, that's why they have all these different things that they're showing you because it's some, somebody who's made all those films before. So that's, that would be my guess. It's probably, probably wrong. That's a great idea. But I that's, think it's a, it's a perfect way to do a misdirect, but also not any kind of a misdirect. Well, because one of the things that fans have been noticing is that these teasers are reminiscent. You can pair a, one teaser up with a classic horror film. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there are some that are more obvious, like The Creature from the Black Lagoon. Right. But then you have stuff like, um, I don't know. I, now I can't think of any examples. Oh, The Woman Walking Up the Stairs in the Shadow, which is kind of similar to Nosferatu. Right. And the list goes on and on. I mean, there's actually some really fun reading about this that would be very cool and maybe the croatoan stuff that we saw was like from a set my guess so yeah man okay i could get on board with that all right how about you mark riley yeah you're, you're on to something schnepp i like that uh and i was thinking about the the because when we saw those set picks that um, it kind of looked like a set. There, it, it, didn't somebody on the panel even mention? Yeah, there's like a mop a over there, so, or a water and, yeah. cooler. So maybe that's a good call, Shanab. And and Perry, I'm with you though. I uh, only saw the first season, so there's a lot I have to catch up on. But when I'm sitting around just mindlessly watching TV, I've seen these things, and I'm just like, and just from all the conversations we've had, I've been like, man, they're really just stringing these people yeah. along, right? Um, but I do like the Creature from the Black Lagoon, kind of um, that one caught my, and the alien abduction, especially that one. If it were me, I would want an alien abduction horror movie because that's just something I like. So I have no idea where they're going with this, though. I don't know why they keep doing this every year and teasing it this way. It just seems weird. Not being somebody that's totally into it, it's very confusing to me. Well, I liked all the promos. I always like knowing what the theme is and seeing how they approach it. Like when you say witches, I mean, the way that they approached the promotional material for Coven was like gorgeous, mm. you know, and their marketing is always great. But so if I had to make a guess and I'm going to side with like, I think what the Internet is guessing and it's the uh, well, actually, I'm not I'm not going to side because the one that I've seen that people are thinking it is is teeth. The one where the woman, uh, the nurse has hedge clippers and there's these teeth that are strung up and mm. she's cutting the teeth and that apparently in season one of murder house there was a killer that did something with teeth but got scrapped during the um during the initial shooting or whatever so mm. maybe that was an idea that got left over but the one i am think i'm most interested in seeing is um a cult theme yeah. so they there's if you look at the one with the little baby who reaches up and pulls the knife down you can see that on the mobile it spells out pig which is uh, a lot of people think a reference to the Sharon Tate murders right. and LaBianca yeah. murders from uh, Charlie Manson. And uh, obviously, as we talked about, I think a couple of weeks ago, you know, the Croatoan thing could have been a cult in the early days. So who knows? But um, yeah, it's going to be very interesting to see if this pays off for American Horror Story. Because by the way, um, I remember Ryan Murphy saying, I want to say, it was at something in January or no, it couldn't have been, but earlier this year that they were thinking of doing two seasons of American Horror Story in 2016. Mm -hmm. I remember writing that up for Collider.com. I think it might have been even further back than that, maybe in the fall. And that was the plan to do two seasons of American Horror Story in a calendar year. And I guess, I mean, maybe if it's if it's a shorter season, something like that could have worked. But he certainly said this year, I remember because I was sitting in the in the Kodak Theater or whatever it's called now, the Dolby, um, listening to him say it, it's going to involve children and it's going to involve opera. Oh, and I'm right. like, yeah. remember the opera what thing? does that even mean? None of these, like none oh, of yeah. this has made its way into, I guess the children kind of has, but. Right. 
maybe they're just all full of crap mm. and they're just teasing us, stringing just us Just to throw along. out a little positivity, if you are an American Horror Story fan like I am and you're pissed about these little promos, just go look up the one that's called Anthology. That, to me, is a very effective promo for a big fan who is looking forward to a new season because it does a little montage, a mm. little bit from each season, yeah. and then you get the question mark. And that's when the question mark means something. Right. Well, and we're all very excited for Halloween Horror Nights. We kind of got distracted, <laughs> but... Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> We yeah, all I can't go. wait for that. My bad. Yeah. So fingers crossed. We're, we're all gonna go together. Yeah. <laughs> and and be scared together. Okay. Um, attention, I Zombie and Veronica Mars friends. It appears that Rob Thomas, not Rob Marshall, uh, <laughs> will be bringing the Lost Boys to the CW. The Hollywood Reporter notes that after a multiple network bidding war, who are these other networks? That's what I want to know. Right. The CW signed Thomas to develop a new take on the 1987 cult classic. The take is ambitious, though. No noting that the series would take place over seven season, seasons with each taking on a different decade. If the show goes to series, THR reports that the first will be set in San Francisco during the Summer of Love, or 1967. Each season in the series will change from time, place, and location, but all of the vampires will remain the same. Now, okay, I love this idea. I love this. And I'm going to be honest with you, I do not love this movie. <gasps> um, yeah, sorry. Wow. Gasp, gasp. Um, oh, wow. it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> I don't love the movie, um, and uh, <laughs> but I understand there are a lot of people who do, but I just think this is a brilliant, brilliant take. And Riley, I know you were almost equally as excited. Yeah, I love the take. I love the movie. It's it's a movie from my t childhood. I mean, I listened to that soundtrack over and over and over again. Um, and, and it has a, a, an edge to it that I don't think a lot of people remember. Um, it, it's actually pretty scary, and I do love it so much. Um, the only hesitancy that I have for this is that it's on the CW. It's, they've never landed with me their shows, any of their horror-themed shows like The Vampire Diaries or something. It just, they don't hit it for me because I want a little bit more edge, I want a little bit more horror. However, Rob Thomas, right, not Marshall? Not Marshall. Rob Thomas. <laughs> I, I really enjoyed uh, Veronica Mars, mm -hmm. but that's a totally different genre, obviously. So, But he's such a fantastic writer. So I, I have a lot of hope for this. I dig the idea of this different decades and the starting summer of love with vampires. That gets me right there. I could just picture a bunch of hippies stoned and getting just their necks just bitten off. I just love it. Well, and I also love what you bring up, the idea that there is an edge to this. Um, you know, these the, the original Lost Boys, these were teenagers, but they yeah. weren't sexy, hot you know, teenagers. They were a little, I mean, they were sexy and hot for different reasons. I mean, reasons, Kiefer I Sutherland I mean, was sexy, huh? what, I, what I meant is they weren't um, like these sanitary, like classic, like model-esque. They were, they were dangerous and yeah. they were dangerous on purpose. That's what I was going to say. Perry, how about you? Are you on okay. board with this? Uh, yeah, I think, I, I think I'm on board. I'm somewhere in the middle because I'm a big fan of Lost Boys and I like their approach to it. I just don't really understand why it needs to be the Lost Boys TV show, mm. which is an issue I have with a lot of remakes and reboots and all that good stuff. Also because really is the Lost Boys name going to be a huge draw for the CW audience? Do we really need to do that? It's a great point. I, yeah. Do they I know the source material? I mean, no. that's what I wonder about. I can't about. imagine yeah. very many of those viewers knowing yeah. about this, but I'm kind of hopeful. I watched uh, the first two seasons of Vampire Diaries. My sister was really into it and I wanted to watch something with her. So I was watching it and I really liked the first two seasons. And then after that is where it kind of, you know, goes off the rails and starts to repeat story beats and characters get whiny and they don't do new things anymore. However, that makes me more hopeful with something like this, where they approach it saying, look at this format we've got, seven seasons, separate it, 10 years per season. If they hash that plan out well right from the start, that could be a really interesting show there. Yeah. All right, Schnepp, yeah. are you going to watch? Probably just season two, because it takes place when Star Wars came out, so <laughs> it'll be like in disco. It'll be a great <laughs> great time for vampires. I love the premise. I don't, I don't care for the movie Lost Boys, so that's not nothing to me i like the idea of traveling through time because that's what vampires are they're time travelers they don't age 
we all humans die. So I love the idea. It's like it's taking some of the greatest storylines from Anne Rice's vampires. Was just it's about a perfect. To say that. I mean, I ripped that off for when I did my underworld cartoon. I had the characters just move through time because that's a great thing. That's the greatest thing that vampires can do is they don't age. So I love this premise and I love that they've already mapped it out to go from 67 to 77 to 87 to 97 to 2007. It's incredibly smart. It'll end, you know, I guess where we are in the future in seven years will be like, hey, if this is in the past, 2017 or whatever. But uh, and I trust Rob Marshall. I mean, Rob Thomas. Rob Thomas. <laughs> or Rob Thomas. Well, look, you know, we talk about horror on the CW. The CW has been flirting with horror. And I'm not talking about Vampire Diaries. Yes, vampires are horrific sure. creatures. But I'm talking about, like, the Friday the 13th show, oh, or, yeah. which is officially canned, by the way. Um, yeah. That came out last week. Or or um, the, um, oh, goodness, Tales from the Dark Side reboot sure. that they've tried to do a thousand times with Joe Hill, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that this could be a great fit, and it might finally kind of kick them into real horror mm. um, I don't know it will be interesting but I hope it happens I'm I'm really on board if it does um, okay so you all you asked we're answering scream the TV series uh, it aired its season two finale last week and Perry pulled an all-nighter mm -hmm. to catch up now Perry is our resident uh, scream fan here uh, obviously film and and television that's where I am not on board um, mm -hmm. but you guys have been asking for it so Perry let's talk what and we'll get our spoiler alert sign up we can we can hold off on the spoilers oh, first okay. I'll just like oh, talk about it generally first just so everyone who might want to get into it has somewhat of a sense of what the deal is with the show. So first, first off, if you ever want to binge watch a show, you should probably plan ahead of time and make sure you know exactly where you are in a season and know how many episodes are in a season, because this mm. one's 12, not 10. And I was up very late last night watching it, but I will say, I am very into it. I don't know if I can call Scream, the TV series, a high quality show, you know, especially when we're busy talking about things like Game of Thrones and stuff like that all the time. It's it's very, got a very MTV vibe. It's got very young characters who make very silly decisions. There's something about the core group that I find very likable and it's a very easy binge. You can just jump from one episode to the next. And with season two in particular, they definitely kind of got their footing a little more. Not that season one was bad, but season two, the episodes, I mean, they work as standalone episodes much better, and then they actually connect a lot better, too. A lot of the performances got better. There's still one that I want to like pluck out of that cast, and I'm not going to name drop her because it makes me feel bad, but there's, there's one or two that don't deliver the greatest performances throughout. But, you know, I'll say as a hardcore Scream movie fan, this isn't necessarily what I would have wanted in a Scream TV series, yet I'm still satisfied. And it still bothers me to a point that they call it a Scream show because it is so... It, it works with a lot of the same themes. It has some very similar kills and very different uh, character types, but you didn't really need it. You could have just called it slasher whatever. Then again, I'll give them the excuse over something like Lost Boys where Scream can draw a crowd, mm. whereas Lost mm -hmm. Boys I don't think can. All right, let's put up the spoiler alert now. All right, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about what happened in season two and how I felt about the ending, which has a pretty big reveal in it. So again, in general, much better this time around. There's a couple of great episodes. I'm glad you said his last name first because I'm just going to call him Dennis and Kevin. Yeah. Their episode, best episode of the whole season. Yay. That to me, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and it's so satisfying. If I go back and watch any of the episodes from season two again, it's going to be that one. I tend, when I watch TV, to prefer, it's just in general, I tend to prefer when episodes narrow their focus and focus on one character versus the five million characters mm. that are running around. And this show does have a lot of them. That one in particular, focuses on one character who gets into trouble, his friends have to help him out, and it adds something to so many characters without having its attention all over the place. So good job to them. One of my favorite parts of the whole thing. Okay, now to the ending. So- oh, Wait, before you get to the ending, like say like someone like me who has never seen this, but I've seen all the movies, Ghostface is the killer. Do no, they have the no, same no, ref no. self-referential? No. Yeah. It's not so, like the movie at all. <laughs> if you go Google my article about that mask, right. it was like an American Horror Story type rant. It I looks kind of like a baby lamb. I was not happy <laughs> like when I saw that or something, picture. 
Love yeah, it. it's a mewling maggot. So, Weird. I'll yeah. sh- schnapp, just so you, and if any of our viewers who are asking themselves this question, I tried okay. to watch season one. I, I think I made it to episode eight, and I was like, you know what? I'm just going to read what happens. I can't watch this okay. anymore. I, yeah. I really did not. So I haven't even tried. I, so. I Did you figure out what happened early on? Because season one, I pegged the killer from like episode three. I didn't. I didn't. But to be honest, to be completely honest, I was so turned off by every single character on that show. I hate all of them. Well, I, I hated all <laughs> of them. Oh, wait. Them. So season two continues with the same characters? Yes. Right. Well, Sorry. I didn't mean to like, get to that spoiler. Die. I just want to learn a little bit about it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Ghost face it up. It. It's not ghost face. It's Who not ghost face. No. It's Brendan or Brandon. Brandon. Brandon James. That's actually one of my least favorite parts of the show. My least favorite part of the show in general is anything that pertains to the adults. And you could probably figure out where my least favorite actor on the cast is. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to say any more than that. <laughs> um, but I don't like the adults and I don't like that mythology. It it didn't really have much of a payoff this season. Mm-hmm. They do a little cliffhanger at the end, but I still don't care where they take that in season three if they get a season three. But the big thing at the very end of the episode was season one, they revealed who the killer was and revealed she had an accomplice. They hinted, or not hinted, flat out said it was Audrey, who is one of the best friends in like the main group of characters. Here, however, she's kind of like a puppet being manipulated and it's another accomplice and I, I love how I'm like afraid to say it, even you though can say just it say it. Spoiler, spoiler it up, alert. say it. So the killer is the the main character's boyfriend from season one, oh. who has been present throughout <laughs> the entire series, and for some like for some random reason, and everyone had said that he was the killer in season one, and then ha ha for for those who weren't like me, I pegged Piper very early on in season one, so I did not think it was him, but a lot of people went through all of season one thinking it was him, then when they found out it was her, oh my God, now it almost feels like they're being jerked around in season two, which I could totally understand, because the show is so busy planting all these seeds and trying to push you in certain directions, and then all of a sudden, out of the blue, I think there was a, a more elegant way to make this happen, and the only credit I'll give to the actor who plays Kieran, uh, I'm a, I'm a Amadeus Serafini, he is so wooden and one note through 90... <laughs> That's giving him credit? <laughs> through through 99% of the okay. show because they give him nothing to do. He goes like cuckoo crazy pants at the end of season two where he reveals himself to be the killer and the kid can act. All of a sudden, he, they give him something to do and he can act. So, so the, the, it's not ghost face, it's cuckoo crazy pants. Yeah, pretty, pretty much. <laughs> All right. That's, that's what that mask deserves. I'll, I'll actually say something about the mask because the mask has grown on me. The more that they show them, when they showed the mask by itself, I'm like, oh, that's not ghost face. I don't know what the hell that is. I don't want to watch it. As the more you see him with the hood and the whole outfit and just like the stature of the character, that to me feels like the imposing force that Ghostface is and it works a lot better. But for people who just want, you know, good scares and blood, I can't believe they're allowed to do some of this on MTV. Mm. I I think it's episode three. Someone just gets just like, it's the one called Vacancy in a hotel room. Someone just Mm. gets like nailed with with a corkscrew. And I'm like, wow, I can't believe you're allowed to show this on this channel. And there, there's a scene, there's one episode where they all drink ayahuasca. And I'm going, really? <laughs> it's just the last thing in the world I expected to happen Hits on this your series. teenager kids. Yep. I don't want to cross the line and call Scream a guilty pleasure. It's kind of towing the line to me between being a guilty pleasure and a somewhat well thought out show. But overall, I really do enjoy it. And I hope it gets a thir- third season because I want to see some more. Do any of the, the male characters have like waxed mustaches <laughs> like a, or like giant beards? <laughs> yeah. Hey, I'm a hipster. I mean, there's no one. All right, good. There's Here, no one that bad. Here's my thing. And, and I didn't, I mean, I had, to, to be fair, I had reservations about Scream to begin with because it's not really Scream. Yeah. I mean, it's a guy in a mask hunting teenagers or a person in a mask that it doesn't take place in Woodsboro it's not Ghostface there's no Sydney Prescott there's no Wes Craven even I mean it it just was like this to me is like Lost Boys being a show about vampire or being a show about werewolves and being like but that's not that's right. not Lost Boys. You know that, what I mean? It's a very fair point, and that is what it is to a degree. There are certain kills that are very reminiscent of things that you have seen in the movie. So as someone who has obsessed over those movies and knows every little mm-hmm. detail, 
I can watch it and pick up on those things and get excited about them. For maybe the MTV generation, who is not as right. familiar as I am, it is any old slasher show to them. It really isn't anything that is specifically Scream. And I have a question. Is it a different killer in the second season? So the first season reveals a killer, and then there's another killer in the second kind season? Of. And they're this, all in the same group? The killer reveal from season two was her accomplice in season one. They were working okay. together. And then they, she's saying then, they made it like they a were, misdirect. Like she was, they I'm were just manipulating a puppet, you know? this other girl, which okay. actually is something that I think they did very well. And that's kind of a big deal with season two, is they, they set this character, Audrey, up as though she was the accomplice and she was the big right. bad. And throughout the course of the season, you know, it's not a thing where in the middle of the season they kind of wipe the slate clean and she gets away with it and she's back in good standing with all her friends. She did some really dark stuff and the show does respect it to a degree. Can I just maybe, if I could get rid of a trope from slasher movies, it would be the boyfriend being the killer. Mm. Never yeah. the boyfriend ever again. Well, they were obviously going for something very specific with this and it did not work. Yeah, mm. I mean, I just, I, again. And they had so many great options too. They had set so many people up to be the killer where even though I had suspected them as they told me to for the most part, I would have been so much more satisfied if one of those people were the killer. Wah, wah. All right. Well, that was a, <laughs> oh. a good review from Perry oh for God. season two of right. Scream. Um, and hopefully if it gets to season three, we will be telling you about it in what's in the box. Okay. Um, and so we did a very special thing, or Perry did a very special thing last week. Uh, Don't Breathe hits theaters this weekend, and she got a chance to talk to the team behind the movie. That I did. I have absolutely no clue what this clip is about that we're going to show you, but I had a really great chat with uh, director Fede Alvarez and the star of the movie who plays the black man Stephen Lang it was a lot of fun to talk to them so check out our clip at the end of the day like it's the blessing for me working with this guy is that you know because of the camera work that it has you need actors that are not just great at what they do but there's a technical aspect of this movie and that's what he was talking about with the the movements of the head and all those certain things that convey that idea of I'm, I'm just listening I'm not looking and and what he, yeah, what he did was amazing. It was that thing they always talk about, it, and I was surprised. And but obviously he's a stage actor, and he could do that. He he was wearing these glasses, you know, these lenses that you mm -hmm. couldn't see much with them. Honestly, in a lo low light situation, he was really not faking him some of that blindness. But he was hitting all his marks in a way that was <laughs> incredible. Like you need, I, I, what I do with the camera, of course, I, say, I know I'm gonna stop right here, and he's running from that place. I gotta stop right there. If he misses by this, he's out of focus, and mm -hmm. just like shot, it's not good, right? And and mastering that level of, you know, the quality of the performances and never missing those technical details, like it's insane for directors. That's a dream come true to have someone is so good at all the aspects of being. A screen actor, right? And I, it was, I had a, he knows, I had a great, lots of fun working with him. I imagine your crew needs to have that level of precision as well, because in scenes like that, where, where does the lighting go? Where does your sound guy go so he's not in frame? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's exactly, well, particularly in the movie, it has those very long shots where the camera goes everywhere, and uh, it, yeah, you need to hide the, the crew all the time. It seems like it's just him in the house, and there's actually four or five people like walking around all the time. And uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the dialogue because there's not much dialogue in the movie, but you do have a few lines. So is that something that's written in the script from day one or is that something you guys find organically on set or maybe in the edit? It was in the script, right? Absolutely in the script. And I think there probably was even a little more in the script than ends up in the film because I, we, I think that we did find that um, anything that, that both physically and I think verbally, in every way, the blind man doesn't do anything that's extraneous. So that's just a little piece of my full interview with Stephen Lang and Fetty Alvarez. Go on the YouTube channel, Collider Videos, right now, and check out the whole thing. And check out Don't Breathe, August 26th. Wonderful. Thumbs up. Uh, I believe John Campia has already put up a non-spoiler review. That would be tonight. Uh, okay, so that's <laughs> coming soon. And then uh, some of us are going to be, or all of us, yeah. are going to mm -hmm. be doing a Hell spoiler yeah. filled review later this week. So stay tuned for all of the Don't Breathe goodness. Mm. Okay, next up, let's get into our jump scares. <laughs> 
Creepy. <laughs> okay, now, yeah. So, there, was, there was an awkward pause there. We needed something. Sorry. So, all right, just for a bit of fun, um, last week, Kevin Bacon responded to a fan on Twitter who suggested that she'd like to see the actor take on the iconic role of Freddy Krueger. When Bacon read her proposition, he replied by saying, I like the way you think, Betty. Now, while this certainly doesn't mean anything for sure, it's fun to think about an actor like Kevin Bacon taking on the role. So I put it to you, panel. Do you think that a widely recognized actor like Kevin Bacon could play such an iconic villain? Or um, And if you could recast a famous monster with any actor, who would it be? And by the way, we had a Twitter question come in that asked us who we wanted to see um, play Freddy Krueger. And they suggested Willem Dafoe. Which Whoa. I thought, now this is a Twitter question that came about six weeks ago, mm. and I'm sorry I don't have your name in front of me, but um, it was a great question. I've been keeping it up here since then, so I thought that was kind of fun. But what do you guys think? Like, Kevin Bacon is a pretty recognizable actor. Mm -hmm. I think maybe, was Freddy Krueger scary in the beginning because he was sort of nobody? I mean, obviously, Robert, don't get me wrong, Robert England was not nobody. He was a working character actor for years and years and years and years. But he disappeared under that makeup, and it was kind of like this this thing, this person you've never seen before. I don't know. What do you guys think? I don't think we can ever be in a situation where whether you cast Kevin Bacon in a role like that or some complete unknown that will ever see the actor through the makeup or should ever. So if they get a big name like Kevin Bacon, it's like when Jackie Earl Hale, I guess I did see some of Jackie Earl Hale. I could Hale. totally yeah. see him through yeah. that makeup. Maybe yeah. that's a bad point, but I don't, I think that they, if we ever get another Nightmare on Elm Street with all the talk about more movies, if someone like Kevin Bacon with such a familiar face is ever cast, that's gonna like drive the movie into the ground if we can see him so much. Right. Although I would like to see him in the role if they do enough enough uh, makeup work. Okay. Yeah. Well, how about you, Riley? Oh, I love the idea of Kevin Bacon doing Freddy Krueger. It just was kind of out from left field for me when I saw <laughs> this, and I was like, kind of thought to myself, I'm like, well, he was in Friday the Thirteenth, but he was killed. All right, yeah, well, we could do this. And then the more I thought about it, well, you said Willem Dafoe, and I'm like, please. <laughs> Put him in there. That would be amazing. Mm -hmm. And because I think the reason you might need a, a, a recognizable actor is because we don't have that mystery of Freddy Krueger anymore like we did for the original. Mm -hmm. And it's somebody just behind the mask. So we need a good actor if they're going to do a decent, proper retelling of Nightmare on Elm Street. So I think then the fans of Nightmare on Elm Street and the fans of the actor who want to see what they do in the role – it might work to their advantage. That's just my two cents. Like you said, Willem Dafoe, I'm like, I would be there opening night for that just because of my love of the franchise mm -hmm. and Willem Dafoe. Do I think Kevin Bacon can do it and disappear? Yes, I think mm -hmm. absolutely he could do it. He's a fantastic actor. He just is. I love him and everything he does. Um, and I, I think it would I think it would totally work. Now, Schnepp, you are less on board with this idea. Yeah, let's just say I hate the idea. Um, <laughs> you know, the opposite of Riley. Um, I love Kevin Bacon. I think he's an incredible actor. I thought he was great, even in like uh, First Class, where he was playing like the leader of the yeah. Hellfire there Club. You go. But you have uh, these '80s iconic horror uh, characters like uh, The Shape or Freddy Krueger or Leatherface, which is you know '70s, but traveling through into the '80s. I mean. It'd be like, let's get John Stamos to play Chucky. I just <laughs> another you know good what I'm choice. Saying? Yeah, I just like I could give you a whole bunch of What's them that wrong are horrible. With that? Yeah, exactly. I, I, I will stop right now. I'm not going to give anyone any <laughs> more can... ideas because I might hate it. Other people are going to love it. I'm not giving you guys any more ideas. But you know, Willem Dafoe, I would agree with because he is a character actor amongst all things. I think he's a great character actor as well as being an incredible actor. So he would disappear into that role. Plus, he's sinister and has that those elements where he could play a good guy. He could play a bad guy. I think yeah. Kevin Bacon is just a really good actor, but I don't want to see the the thing for me is like you got to take something that's so old to refresh it. Like that's why the mummy or the famous monsters by getting Russell Crowe to play Dr. Jekyll and having all of these well-known big name actors to be in the brand new Universal Monsters, that's going to be the breath of fresh air that it needs 
that I personally feel that it needs if they put it they, if they're putting it all together in the right way. And we still haven't seen any of that yet. It could be a giant bungle fest. Yeah. Dracula Untold. It was like I hated that. So there's a whole bunch of like bad mistakes that have already started. We're like, ah, oh, we're not really going to do that, even though that was supposed to start it. We don't know how they're going with that. But for someone like Freddy Krueger, I would like to see even like you said, uh, Earl Haley. I could tell it was him. Mm -hmm. And it was even though he's a character actor, just I want a complete unknown. And and Robert Englund, when that movie was made, was an unknown character. Sure. Actor and he his star rose because of that yeah. role. So I would like to see also another couple unknowns take those shapes, especially with a Michael Myers. It doesn't matter who it is. It's a William right. Shatner mask, right. you know. I mean, with Freddy Krueger, it really matters. Now, mm. how about how about like another actor taking on a, an, a, an iconic monster? Uh, for me, uh, so I would really like to see. Uh, you guys ask us about this movie all the time about. Uh, Hellraiser and Ooh, Hellraiser yeah. I think is one of the great untapped worlds mm -hmm. like I love the first movie I know the franchise has its fans but to me there is so much smart dangerous horror in my, to be mined in that franchise and you know, unfortunately, the production company that owns the rights, I don't think is interested in making smart, you know, yeah. dangerous horror. They're interested in sequels and franchises, whatever. But the reason I was trying to think of Michael Fassbender's name is because I would love to see Michael Fassbender as Pinhead. Yeah. As somebody who is stern and sexy, but really dangerous mm -hmm. like oh my god um i think that that could be amazing and yeah so that's that's my vote that's the best idea i've I heard love in it. a very long time yeah yeah, I'm still, I'm still hating that idea. Oh, <laughs> I, I kind of well, just, I just saw the lights between the oceans. I could see Michael Fassbender. I have such sights to show no, you. No, not a sad Michael Fassbender. No, I know. A scary fact, one. He would be great as Pinhead. I just think the the point of like putting these big name actors, like why not have Brad Pitt play Frankenstein and Angelina Jolie play the Bride of Frankenstein? I think, you know, <laughs> they I mean, probably tried I'm, to do I'm that. Half yeah. joking on that. They could do Angelina it. Angelina I mean, Jolie was it, attached it to yeah. Bride. Yeah. Probably would be cool. I don't know. I mean, I like that, you know, people like Doug Bradley get the chance to be pinned. Sure. I don't I I like the idea that character actors can still play character actor roles and I don't need to see these big name actors take every single role and especially it's great to have a really good actor play a role but someone like you there's a million people in theater who deserve a chance to become Pinhead. Right. So yes. I could name well, 5,000 people. So Schnepp doesn't want to play my game, but how about you guys? <laughs> not playing it, Clark. I, <laughs> not doing it. Uh, well, how about uh, Daniel Day-Lewis as Jason Voorhees? Can we do that? No? <laughs> Does that work? Stop. AKA Stop. the cobbler. So Mark Riley doesn't want to play my game. <laughs> no, either. I think, but I, to, to speak on your point, Schnepp, I think our uh, Nightmare on Elm Streets and Freddy's and, and uh, Friday the 13th are becoming, they're sooner or later going to be like the universal classic monsters. Mm -hmm. They're my classic monsters. So I think that's why this story about Kevin Bacon being Freddy is kind of like a jolt to the the, the wide audience is because they need something that's going to reinvigorate it but I'm I'm in theory I'm totally with you we need like a, a character actor to come Channing in. Tatum as Ash in the Evil right. Dead we'd never yeah. have Bruce Campbell if we did exactly. this kind of stupid they're going to redo <laughs> these things and they're going to inject it with an, an A-list celebrity right. so I love but I, I can't really even think of anything like Michael Fassbender as Pinhead is inspiring I, lo I love it so I'm, I'll try to think money, of one give me your money Hollywood I'll try to let think me one. make movies don't, let me make don't scary give movies. Clark I'll your money middle. I'll kind of play your game but lean towards schnapp side here Game, Clark. <laughs> I I don't care what monster we're talking about. Let Doug Jones or Javier Botet play totally. him. I don't mm. know if I've ever brought up the Mama Motion Test. You on have. have We've talked about that. Yeah, is, that is freaky. really just one of my favorite videos yeah. ever. Where if they didn't change what they did in that motion test and they just put that in Mama, I would have been very happy. So, look at what Javier Botet is capable of in that video and. You can add a lot to any existing monster out there where it would give a really interesting new layer to the physicality. And of you the brought character. up Doug Jones. That's another amazing actor who's been shortchanged by Hollywood left and right. He played the Silver Surfer, but then they got Lawrence Fishburne to do the voice. Yeah. Even though Doug Jones' voice was perfectly fine, it's that, you know, we got to bring in a big, a big actor. It's, it doesn't matter if the movie's good, if the story's good, if the acting is good. So To your Javier Botet. Uh, have, uh, point. Have you seen the leaked it photos of him on set? Oh no. What? Okay. I didn't put this in our show because this is just speculation and it's spoilers and it's not. Oh, they're both Googling. Wow. <laughs> they don't watch they're using that. Google. Oh, they're like, they're like, Excuse they're, me. Um, clackety, 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 unless clackety. I'm wrong. 
Please do not. I no, I'm His looking. Le- I'm uh, looking. Leaper, leper. Like, did I? Am I wrong? What's that? It was on. It was on no. bloody disgusting. Well, we'll get to it later. Oh, anyway, okay. he he's Google Javier Botet and leper, L E P E R. L E E P R. Not leopard. We're on the air. We don't need to do this now. Yeah. We'll get back no, everybody to everybody. Carry on. We're uh, looking up leaked I photos. See, okay, I Harry bow. found it. I'm not crazy. It is. It is. It isn't it. We, anyway, <laughs> um, so <laughs> we, don't, we don't have to watch Perry Google. Hey, or, how about Daniel Day-Lewis? Yes. As so first. <laughs> anyway, the reason I did not put this in our show is because it's major mad spoilers. Um, okay. You don't need to see the creature walking around with his assistant, uh, you know, and take you completely out of it. But right. yeah, get Perry's face. Get her reaction. See? Oh, my but, God. <laughs> so Google at your own risk. We've taken we've taken a turn. Uh oh, right. <laughs> I gotta look at that. Forget I, I about do it. it here. Go- Google at your own risk, and uh, but he'll be he. I, my point in bringing all of this up is that I think Javier Botet will be getting much more uh, call, more phone calls after he is in it. I like the sound of that. All right. Well, and I hope they keep with that trend though of, of pulling in these unrecognizable but talented, insanely talented actors to do these monsters because they're monsters for a reason. They exist in the shadows. We don't need a big name actor to pull it off because that's just stunt casting at the end of the day. That's where I land with all of this. Yeah. All right, Keanu Reeves as the chatterer, also in Hell Hellraiser. Then. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, why okay. not? Come on, that's you awesome. Naysayer. Let's move into Twitter questions. So um, since you guys are such big Scream fans, because I swear y'all have tweeted at the, me about this more than maybe any other thing, um, we're going to do a Scream-flavored Twitter question yeah. series this time around. So first up, uh, at Xlayer asks, do you think there's any chance in hell that MTV's Scream series will ever connect the films? Bring in Gail and Sydney. Now, okay, no is my answer. However, if they did, I'm being serious, if MTV Scream announced we're having Nev Campbell come back or we're having, like, you know, Courtney Cox come onto the show, I would start watching. Really? I, I would definitely start I, I watching. I probably would too. You shouldn't yeah. have said that out loud. Now it's going to happen. Good. That makes me so nervous. Again, Hollywood, are you listening? I would start watching if Kevin Williamson started writing it. Dude, totally. Or yeah. if Wes Craven were directing it. Well, he can't. I know. But you could bring Kevin Williamson. Yeah, you could. All right, what about you guys, though? Do you think there's any chance in hell that the original cast would come back? Or they would have them? I, I lean against it. One, because I think with the story that they've set up so far, that would be really really silly if two towns just happen to have serial killers in this respect so i don't think that would make much sense at all and also they've done such they've gone to such lengths to make certain characters like like one producer i think even referred to one character who was introduced in season two as that as the uh, gail weathers of the show and mm. i can see I that in her so gail it would weathers. bother me and then, then it would be doing what Scream 3 did with Parker Posey and uh, Courtney Cox, and I wouldn't want that either. But I think it's just a, a big fat no. I don't really think it's, it's suitable for the story. And, you know, it's like what they did with the mask, too. The, the producers at that time, when people were pissed about the mask, they came out and said, we don't want to be beholden to what they did in the Scream movies. We want it to be our own thing. So Also, they didn't want to pay for it. Well, mm-hmm. well, that too. But assuming they're not desperate for, for, uh, for views, which they might. I don't know how the ratings were on that show. I don't think it's ever going to happen. I like the idea, though, now that you bring it up, of having, like, Ghostface versus uh, Spooky Poopy Pants or whatever his <laughs> name is. Kooky Poopy Pants or whatever the new... I'm Baby Lamb Face or whatever his name is. <laughs> Matthew <laughs> something or Brandon something. All right. Do you have anything you'd like to add to no, Poopy Scoopy Face? The poopy, just <laughs> Pooper Scooper Pants, whatever that name is, deserves a mm. horror franchise. I, I, I just don't think they're going to bring... Um, I, well, it, it's hard for me to comment because I don't watch the show. So it, it's obviously different and not set in Woodsboro anymore. So, and then I think that, honestly, I think, um, and I'm blanking on her, was, who played Sydney. Why can't I remember? Nev Campbell. Nev Campbell, thank you. I don't think Nev Campbell would come back, uh, honestly, the actress, because I think she would probably look at the character and went, Sydney's been through enough. Yeah. Like, she's, she's already had four movies where how many times is the same thing going to keep happening to her? And so, I don't know. It, it I think, but uh, now I'm starting to go, I think they're going to tie it to the movies sooner or later, sooner or later, in some way, maybe not a character, 
but just somehow to probably pull in those viewers that they're going to need as they may be limping along in the fourth or fifth season. Well, and I think Nev Campbell has has said, like, Wes Craven is the Scream franchise mm -hmm. for her. So if right. Wes yeah. isn't on board, then she's not on board. There and, you go. You know, there you go. Anything oh, well. else you want to add? No, okay. keep it that way. Okay. <laughs> all right, all right, fair enough. Um, okay, next up, another Scream adjacent question from James Bouchel. Uh, I have, or how have cell phones changed horror films? I feel like movies always need to explain them away now. This is a great question. Um, and it is, you are right, James, they do need to explain them away. And um, I think, but oh, speaking of Scream, you know what's funny? I, I saw a screening of it uh, back in January. And the way they reacted to the cell phone was honestly the only thing that was dated about the whole movie mm -hmm. was right. him. And they didn't even call it a cell phone. They called it a cellular. That's <laughs> right. Your cellular. What are you doing with this cellular? Where you know, they cloned the cellular. <laughs> I mean, it was just, it was hilarious. Right? But I don't remember what director it was, but somebody said very recently, um, you know, doing movies, horror movies in a period setting was actually better because you don't have to deal with cell phones. Right. Um, so I don't know, you the, guys? Yeah, well, that was my point because I think we live in a time now where a cell phone is next to you at every moment and you have to travel way, unless the movie's set in the woods, you inevitably have to set up that I have no cell yeah, my service. My signal's off. I can't seem to. Yeah. Exactly. It's a monster. <laughs> because unfortunately, yeah. we're now at a point in our society where if a killer or something attacks you, somebody's going to go to their cell phone, or somebody in the audience is going to go, "Well, use your cell phone, right. dummy." Right. You know, and so you have to work it in somehow into the story, so that. The, the the hard part is trying to figure out how to do it organically and creatively to get rid of that cell phone because you want that out of there right away yeah. so you can get that tension in there. I agree with that. Go back in time, period piece, get rid of the cell phones because, yeah, you think about Friday the 13th in the woods, there was no cell phones yeah. and there's ba barely a landline. So there it is. Yeah, there's definitely no getting around addressing cell phones and technology in yeah. general. but. At the same time, while that may be a bit of a burden, it also opens up the door for brand new kinds of storytelling, like certain found footage, that, like Unfriended, things like that. So that's the bright side of it. But I mm -hmm. will say there was one point in Scream season two where a character loses her cell phone and she doesn't freak out about it. And I'm like, wait, you don't have your priorities straight, girl. You got stuff on your phone. You need to be freaking out and looking for it right now. And it bothered me. Fair enough. Yeah, I think the easy the easy solution is I remember even like in the early two thousands is like oh they're up in the mountains and like there's a storm coming in so the cell yeah. phone it's like it's you just have to get rid of the cell tower yeah. you you ha that's been brought in now as as a device that if you don't want people to be able to instantly communicate with them each other you have to bring that in so everyone should just make their movies in a post apocalyptic <laughs> setting and then that's they right. don't have to deal with any of no it at all no cell phone communication no electricity dude if yeah. you are looking for a slasher movie uh, that relies on cell phones actually embraces cell phones and live streaming uh, there is a great short by a director Jason Perlman named called live and it was put up on awesomeness TV um, and it is fabulous it is a 12 minute I believe short all about what happens when a live stream uh, a killer a masked killer uses a live stream Ooh, so I'm gonna go like watch that. that after this check it out <laughs> check it out live on awesomeness TV okay and finally Tony Morrow asks what are your Tony Morrow what's who <laughs> in the house what are your favorite uh, post scream slasher films this is a great question scream kicked off yeah it reignited totally. the slasher genre so so Perry, you this is a stressful question. I know, but this is, I this know is you like have an a answer. question like targeted at everything I love. Don't, I don't list off 40 movies. I only I have can't seven. Help it. All, right. So, all right. I don't want to be beholden to this as my top three, but I'm just gonna shout out, and it's kind of cheating because you know what what really is a slasher movie? In, mm -hmm. Unless you're going traditional ghost face type stuff. But I'm gonna break the rules a little bit and say Final Destination. Yeah. And I'm going by movies not that I think are the best movies out there. These are the ones that I watch over and over and over Body since Scream movies. has come out. Yes. Yeah. Final Destination, The Strangers, and The Hills of Eyes remake. There okay. You go. Those are my Those are favorites. Good choices. Mm -hmm. Schnapp, you got any? Yeah, I got uh, High Tension. I thought that was a really cool one. Um, let's see. Uh, You're Next was also yeah. a good yeah. slasher, yeah. kind of a remake yeah, type yeah, yeah. thing. 
Um, Cabin in the Woods. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. that did have that slasher mentality. And my favorite is Behind the Mask, The Rise Good of Leslie Vernon. Choice. Great one. That was my favorite, newest one. If you yeah. have not seen that, go yeah. watch it for sure. Yeah. All right, Riley. Yeah, this one was hard for me too. Uh, but because there was a lot of reboots then came out after mm. Scream. So um, the best reboot for me was the Hill, Hills Have Eyes and uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I thought was a pretty mm. decent and pretty Those good. Those two remakes do not get enough love. Yeah, Texas the, Chainsaw and Texas Chainsaw The Beginning, I think those are really creepy solid films. I, I didn't like The Beginning, but I enjoyed the hell out of the remake of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Right, which, with Jessica Biel? Uh, was it Jessica Biel? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, which surprised the hell out of me because tech, the original Texas Chainsaw is so close to my heart. But those are the ones. But I'm going to mention a, a one that surprised the hell out of me that I thought was so good, and that's The Town That Dreaded Sundown. Ah, that yeah. remake is kind of a, a meta sequel. Yeah. And it's about everybody that starts watching the original Town uh, That Dreaded Sundown, and then that same dude shows up and starts killing him, and it's like, what's going on? It's really good, guys. So that's that's one of my favorites, actually. Very clever. clever Just to girl. clarify yeah. really quick, the beginning is the Jordana Brewster one. Yes. Texas Chainsaw is the Jessica Biel one. There it is. All right. Um, mine would be Unfriended. I count Unfriended as a slasher movie. I think it is the most modern slasher movie that we have. I'm serious. I love that you say this, because yeah. I'm a big fan of Unfriended. Yeah, and I do. I think it's a slasher movie. And I'm going to break the rules a little and say Scream 2, because yeah. guess what? Scream 2 um, was obviously directly influenced by Scream 1, but I don't think Scream 2 gets enough credit. I think yeah. it is a perfect horror sequel. Mm, it's perfect. really good. Yeah. And it is amazing how it is able to change on a dime from being very scary to being very funny to being romantic to being a coming-of-age story to being really scary again. Um, so go watch Scream 2 if you haven't seen it in a while. I, I am a huge fan of that movie, and they're perfect complements to one another. So, okay, that's it. We probably had a long show today, but that's okay. Um, Just so you know, if you are a fan of Collider Video, I have a big thing coming up this Friday. Whoa. Yep, I am uh, battling Mr. Dan Merle for, yes, there I am, bloody, covered in a <laughs> bloody <laughs> t-shirt, battling Mr. Dan Merle for the title, the belt. I want that belt, y'all, so um, tune in to Collider Video. Yeah. You're going to get that belt, Hungry Clark. like the wolf, she's going to eat him up, yes. <laughs> tear him up. Merle, you're going down. You're my pick because I've done the, the championship belt. I lost it. Christian always calls me the former champ, so I want the new champ to be you, Clark, and just you're going to go in there and Dan's nothing. Whatever. I'm, Get out of here, buddy. Uh, I'm nervous. But, yeah, you don't know, be. I, I want, I want that belt, son. Just Duran Duran him. Right? Bam. Hungry. <laughs> Rio, son, you're going home. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so don't miss it on Friday. And I'd like to thank the panel. Perry, where can everyone find you? You guys can catch me on Twitter and Instagram. At PNMROF, I won't be here next week, but I'll be bringing the heart to New York One in New York next week. So that's something. And you can also catch me back here the next Tuesday on Collider Nightmares and every Saturday on Best of the Week. And Mr. John Schnepp. You guys can uh, follow me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnapp. I got Collider Heroes tomorrow. And come to Palm Springs. I'm doing the co- the Palm Springs Comic Con this weekend. So come oh, on by. I want to go to that. Nice. All right, Mark Riley. Oh, you can find me at Riley around on Twitter and Instagram. I'll be on the Schmoes No Main Show on Thursday, doing Collider Mailbag on Sunday. Back here on Nightmares next Tuesday. Man, you guys are all so busy. Uh, yeah. Don't forget to watch Collider Movie Talk tomorrow morning. And you can find me at Clark Wolf, Clark with an E, Wolf with an E. Thank you all so much for watching. And until next time, we will see you in your nightmares. <laughs> hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.